Our text today says, leaving the elementary teaching, let us press on. We're in this wonderful series that we're looking at over the next six weeks about looking and addressing our very call to welcoming one another that states our purpose, our mission, really answers the who, what, when, where, and how, and why we gather. And today our focus is that phrase that really speaks out that we offer a lifetime of spiritual growth. We offer a positive, practical approach to a lifetime of spiritual growth. Therefore, this text is so appropriate that talks about leaving the elementary understanding of Christ, moving into a greater knowledge and comprehension, a stronger awareness of the divine, calling it a spiritual maturity in our lives. Now, the book of Hebrews, then, that writer must have known a few things about humanity, a little bit about us, that maybe our human nature can be a little bit immature. And our spiritual life, it too, can be a little bit immature. In fact, some of us may be stuck in third grade with our maturity levels, and we act out in ways that not always are our highest and best, and we can speak and say things a little immature. How about the man who said, my wife told me I was immature? And I needed to grow up. Guess who's not allowed in my treehouse anymore? My boyfriend told me I was too childish last week while we were shopping. I was so shocked I almost fell out of the shopping cart. My girl broke up with me. She thinks I'm childish. That's crazy. I finally calmed down, took a deep breath. I went to her house, rang the doorbell, and ran away. Ha ha. <laughs> a woman passed out while giving birth to twins. And she was leaving uh, the naming process up to her immature but very witty brother. She wakes up a little while later and asks her brother, well, what'd you name my newborn baby girl? Denise. Oh, that's not so bad. I like that. That's kind of pretty. Wow, that's a beautiful name. So what did you name the baby boy? The nephew. <laughs> Sometimes in life, we've got a little bit immaturity, and we need to move on, don't we? Sometimes we just need to grow up, and that's what the ancient scriptures, the text, the Bible is always offering us this wonderful pathway to a spiritual maturity. And here at City of Light, we name this, we claim this, this is our purpose. We speak this, and we say, this is a place where, stating our intention for gathering, this is a place where we offer a positive and very practical approach to a lifetime, not just a short journey, but an ongoing process of spiritual growth and spiritual development, moving from that which we may be an immature understanding to a very mature knowledge and comprehension of what it means to be a child of God. It's a positive and practical spirituality that offers us insight, teaching these spiritual laws that we keep talking about over and over again, the laws of sowing and reaping and understanding that we can trust these laws, we can depend upon these laws, we can rest upon these laws, they're like, they are the promises of God. They're the essence of how God works within our hearts and our lives. We teach the practical approach of renewing our mind, that beautiful scripture that says, be ye renewed, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And how important that is that we understand that we shift consciousness, we renew our thoughts, we welcome them again in that born again journey. It says, today I think in a new way. I may have been thinking this way and struggling, but now I welcome the truth, and I think in this way, and the new thought comes to my heart and life, and I'm awakening to this power within me. We talk about the practicality of understanding God's oneness, and that there is no separation. Though we may find in our world today doctrines and people trying to preach constantly that God is far removed and has no uh, interest in you until somehow you make amends and you change your ways. And then suddenly might God might entertain and experience a relationship with you. But we know the truth is that there is no separation. There is a oneness that we live out in our lives. So we offer these truths that take us beyond the elementary teaching of what we understand our faith to be and move us in a journey of maturity that's helping us to really understand what it is to be a person growing in our spirituality. Years ago, I had the chance to chat with one of my uh, spiritual mentors uh, in the, a de denomination I was participating in, and she asked me very clearly, what is it you love the most about your profession? I said, it's the teaching. She said, oh, you like to teach? 
I said, no, it's the teaching. Well, you like to teach classes? You're enjoying teaching classes? You're enjoying teaching? No, I enjoy the teaching. But what? Not comprehending and not understanding what we're talking about is the very teaching of Scripture, the very teaching of Jesus, the very teaching that's set before us, the very spiritual truths that are unfolded for our lives. What? There's a teaching? So many of us come to church and we think, well, it's all about worship. It's all about singing. It's all about, you know, choirs and great music. It's all about, well, that five-minute little homily that some pastors would offer. Maybe not here. Uh, but, you know, we know that uh, we think that that's what it's all about. And then we realize, wait a minute, there's a teaching. There's something more to us in our spiritual life. We gather for a teaching that is there for us. And I said, this is what I love. This is what makes my spirituality so powerful and true. So many times in the journey of my life as I faced obstacles, hardships, challenges, I am so grateful. I think it's the teaching that sustains me. The very words of Jesus, the very truth that's found within Scripture, the ancient text that unfolded something that I can believe in, that's practical, and that really is so positive, it's working in my life over and over again. So many people don't understand. It's the truth that sets you free, says the scripture. It's the truth that we embrace. It's the truth that is the teaching. The teaching is of the truth. So we understand this then like, ah, that's our liberation. That's our freedom. That's our salvation. When we begin to understand the journey of this powerful teaching and how it unfolds in our life. And boy, don't we know this at City of Life. Over the years, we have been people who speak the words of faith. And have we not seen the transitions, the changes, the answers to our prayers, the manifestations of God's blessings and gifts? Those of us who've been around for a while, of the 19 years I've served as your pastor, can remember many a tropical rainstorm flooding our facility and damaging it all out and wondering how on earth was it going to be possible? And then lo and behold, things come together and the miraculous unfolds and it's even better than before. How many remember the leaking roof? And you can imagine all the challenges we had where we put out buckets there to catch the rain in the former sanctuary and how we roped off areas. Don't sit here unless you're expecting to be baptized. Uh, so we were kind of like in this kind of zone where we said, you know, wait a minute, this is not going to work for you because we've got a sieve for a roof. And we wondered, how would we ever have the funds to repair this? And then God sends a truck, another tropical storm that wipes it all out. And the insurance company says, new carpet, new paint, new roof, new this, new that. And before you know it, God has made a way where there seemed to be no way. And then the beautiful sanctuary that had been heated and air conditioned since 1963 with an antiquated system, it gives out. And we have zero air and zero heat. So in the winter, we prayed for those wonderful days when you cozy up next to the person next to you, and hopefully we could create 66 degrees to 68 in the sanctuary. And then in the summer, we put big, gigantic fans blowing cold air into the sanctuary, hoping to cool it down, uh, you know, and maybe bring it, the temperature down to at least to 74 degrees so that the perspiration wasn't quite so heavy uh, as if you had seemed like you'd been baptized. So what we're trying to do is understand how is God going to make a way when there seemed to be no way? We looked at the finances and said $200,000 to put in new air and heat in this building? How would we embrace that? Plus our mortgage, plus everything else. We were thinking it's not possible. And one day a neighbor comes by and says, can we buy your building? And God makes a way when there seems to be no way. And he purchased it for seven times what we paid for the building. And suddenly, in that wonderful way of manifestation of the teaching of faith, of the belief of that which you sow, you shall reap all at work within our lives, we find ourselves in, in lush cash of $3 million. And let me tell you this. It was a delightful experience as a pastor to walk into the bank where suddenly we say, uh, and what's my deposit? Oh, $3 million. What? Did you say that again? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Three? Did, was it three? Did you say three? Uh, three million. And suddenly the banker is saying, oh, Reverend Gratz, have a seat. Oh, we have a personal banker for you. What, can I get you a drink? What can I offer you? How can I cater to you? And when you come in, please know that, you know, you have access to the private suite within the bank, you know, where you can instantly, all of a sudden, how beautiful it was then when we spent the money. And the banker says, you're who? You're Reverend what? You spent all the money? 
You've got nothing in the bank. Uh, you see, we got to laugh about the interesting relationship shifts. But we said, God makes a way. We believe it. It's practical. It's positive, And we put it to work. And we've seen it here uh, firsthand. So we understand this teaching being so uplifting so filled with hope and faith and the sense of knowing that we just live out differently, that when obstacles come, we've been able to face them, look at them face to face, head on. You know, Tammy Faye Baker, remember her? With the PTL club and the big eyelashes, the heavy makeup and the wonderful uh, voice that would always sing out in the PTL club. Well, she would always advocate when something comes at you and it seems like a lion with a roar, I invite you to run to the roar. And that's truly our faith. It's positive. It's practical. It says when we see the challenge, we don't run from it, but we stand strong in faith, knowing, believing, trusting. And that we've evolved so through these wonderful years of experience to say we stand on these promises and we can face the roar and run to it rather than run from it. For this kind of spiritual growth is positive, and let me tell you this, it's very difficult to grow in the world of negative spirituality, where there's all kinds of guilt, shame, self-hatred. Many of us have experienced that kind of theologies in our growing up journeys with previous spiritual traditions, constantly imparting, you know, you're guilty, you're bad, you're a sinner, you uh, should be ashamed of yourself. You have to deal with this uh, burden of guilt and shame upon your life to the realms of many times feeling so a level of self-hatred so strong that we feel like, well, how can we continue with God? Very difficult to grow in an environment of negative spirituality. But we find churches preaching. We find spiritual communities. We find traditions that are echoing these voices of negativity. And you wonder why the Hebrews... The writer of Hebrews is speaking to churches and saying, it's time to grow up. It's time to leave the elementary and press on towards the spiritual maturity. To move on in ways where we have come to a place where we've experienced something that's actually practical for our lives. Because if you don't have a spirituality that's practical, how do you expect to work it? You know, you're all thinking about how do I work this? It just doesn't seem very common sense oriented. It's all mystical. It's all just accepted by faith. Don't really break it down. Don't try to understand it. Just accept it for what it is and, and enjoy the mystery of it all. And you're wondering, but how does it work? How is it that uh, when I speak affirmatively, suddenly I understand where before people were saying, just, just beg and plead with God. And, you know, he throws enough stuff out there sooner as something's going to hit and something will stick, you know, and we just kind of pray that way. Like, oh, God, maybe this or God that and I beg and beg. We learn a positive, practical approach in prayer that says, this I believe, this I affirm, this I know to be my truth. We find the answer in the words of our prayer as we pray that way, because we say, and so it is. That's amen. Amen is, and so it is. Sometimes we forget what amen means. We think it's like, uh, it's the end, roll the credits. Uh, like the end of the movie, uh, we add the amen to the end of a sermon, end of a, uh, end of a prayer, as if it's like, okay, that's done, let's wrap it up and go home. But it's really, and so it is, meaning it is finished. Yes, it is accomplished. It's done for us. And how beautiful it is that we understand this practical kind of faith, so positive, that it allows us to really grow. For this spiritual life that we're living on this earth is here about fulfilling our purpose. Our purpose. What do you think you came here to do? What do you think your soul came here to do? You know, you came here to experience God in the physical context. That's what you came here to do. Now, I have two kids, and sometimes on a summer vacation, we'd head up to the beach. We'd get to the beach, and the kids would say, well, wait, what are we doing here at the beach? I mean, there's no video games. There's no TV. There's no cartoons. There's no... What are we doing here at the beach? I said, you came to the beach. This is what we came here to do. Enjoy the water. Enjoy the beach. Oh, that's what we came here to do. That's right. In our spiritual life, what did you come here to do? The reason you're here, your soul is here in this moment, 
is to experience the divine. And there's no other reason for you to be here other than that. So let's get about the business of experiencing, of doing what we came here to do. And that is to grow, to mature spiritually, to discover fully who we are, to experience this self-realization of who I am as the divine child of God. Understanding that and what that means for us and how it shifts and changes our life. This is what we came to do. So let's get about the business of doing just that. And that begins with a time of awakening, with a spiritual alarm going off within our lives. It says, wait a minute, I need to be alert. I need to be awakened. I need to be ever attentive to all these wonderful things in our life of the things that God has for us. We really need to learn to pay more attention. Say that with me. Pay more attention. That's right. You know, we've got to be these people who are really attentive. You know, Robert says, I never pay attention to him. At least that's what I think he said. And so it is in our spiritual lives. God is speaking to us. Are you paying attention? Or, well, I don't know. I think God spoke to me. I don't know. I don't know if I'm really alert, if I'm really awake, if I'm really attentive to these things. Because this is our journey here on this earth. It's to expand our understanding, expand our knowing, expand our experience in the divine. We come to this wonderful place where I've had this wonderful journey where we sing that old hymn, I come to the garden alone. And when the dew is still on the roses, we sing that hymn, and he walks with me and he talks with me. You all know that old traditional hymn. That's the very spirit of the spirit walking with us, talking with us, experiencing about that's why we're here. This is a place where positive practical spirituality is offered for you that you may experience the divine and it be real and genuine within your heart and your life. That you may come to the place where you're fully conscious where your soul and your mind are coming together, your thoughts and your purpose of being here are coming together in sense of oneness, and suddenly you're feeling like, I'm fully conscious, fully awakened, fully aware. I am actually paying attention to my spiritual life and really offering direction to it. I'm attentive to all the things that are unfolding for me in the many ways God is at work within my heart and life. And here's now how we become fully conscious. This is what we're doing. This is what we offer for you in this experience here. In life, we know that there are various different stages we may grow through and go through. We have a child stage, right? Some of us can remember that child stage where we were a child and somewhat childish, and some of us may still be in that stage, no matter what age we may be. It's that stage of help me, help me, I'm dependent, I need something, I need guidance, help me, help me. Then there's the teenage stage. And we've moved on a little bit more where we're seeking our own independence. I don't need that help. I can do this myself. We're kind of in a rebellious state, maybe. We're asking lots of questions, and we're trying to find out who we are. Some of us may still be in that teenage stage in our life, no matter where we are in our age. Then there's that adult stage where we're mature. We come to a place where we accept responsibility, and we have a greater focus. We think about we were a child. We were a teenager. We've evolved to a level of maturity. So it is in our spiritual life. We have these different phases that we may be growing and going through within our life as we journey through a lifetime of spiritual growth. I love that. A lot of people say, well, I went to Sunday school. I don't need anything more. I understand, you know, that, you know, Moses in the ark. I get it. I understand, you know, Noah uh, leading the children of Israel across the Red Sea. I understand, certainly, you know, uh, you know, James getting out of the boat and walking on the water, and Peter did something, a fish fry or whatever. I understand it all, you see. And you can understand that, well, maybe they don't understand. They got little nibbits, little snippets, little cl- clips that they've tried to put together and say, but I know it. I got enough. I don't need a class. I don't need Sunday school. I barely need church. I got it all down pat. Pastor, I know it. I went to Sunday school. I've been confirmed, I've been recognized, I've been baptized, I've been dunked, I've been sprinkled, I've been all these wonderful things. I don't need anything more. 
Yet, what we understand is that it's a lifetime of growth. Just as your physical body is growing and changing, your spiritual life is growing and changing. And it needs that support for this lifetime. So in our spiritual life, there are different stages that we may go through as well. And this is a place where we offer you that help and support through the spiritual stages in your life. So that first stage in our spiritual life is about hope. Second is about faith. And the third is about knowing. That first stage, let's look at it. It's about hope. It's about hope that we may bring within our lives. And it's the beginning because everybody wants to hear something very hopeful, right? We want to hear and grasp onto something of hope. And it's a place where we acknowledge a high possibility that, well, I hope, I hope something might happen. I hope, I'm just believing it's hope is sort of a, an imagination coupled with a dream, filled with a desire, and surrounded by lots of doubt. That's right. Hope is just, oh, I think, maybe. I hope, oh, it would be great if. But you see, that's the stage we may start out within our spiritual life, surrounded with hope. And this, unfortunately, is the weakest energy level of a spiritual journey in all of our lives. Not a bad thing to have hope. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm just saying that there's something more that we want to elevate to than just, I hope maybe it would be nice if, wow, that's not a very powerful spiritual life, is it? I mean, how many things times that we would say, well, I hope God makes a way. It sure would be nice. I don't know if the children of Israel, when they stood at the edge of the Red Sea, standing there and with the Pharaoh's army behind them, ready to destroy and take them back into captivity, going, I hope it sure would be nice. It would be good. But I'm not sure. Maybe, kind of. I'm imagining, but I'm full of a lot of questioning and wondering, and that's kind of what hope is. You see, it's that place where they were wanting something more. We're still thinking there might be something more, but there is something more in our life. There's an evolution moving to another state. For in our lifetime, we may begin where someone has instilled some hope. And you think, really? You mean it's possible I could have an, a wonderful experience in the divine? Really? You're giving me hope to believe that maybe it's possible that God would love me? Oh, that's a wonderful place to begin. But we can't stay there because there's something more. You see, if we're using our awareness then we're putting our energy into something more than hoping. We're actually coming to the place of knowing. And we come to the place where we can move on to a higher level or maturity of understanding. So how do we get to this awareness, this kind of level? We move to the next stage. We want to bring people from hope into faith. Faith is the next step of our level of maturity where we come from. I now move from, well, it would be nice if... To know faith that says, you know what, I trust. I trust in the Lord. I move from it's nice if God does something wonderful to now I trust that God is doing something wonderful within my heart and life. And it's a conviction that we have within our lives. It's a state of confidence that we've come to. We've matured. We've left the maybe to now I trust in the divine. And it generates a new level of optimism for us within our lives. But wait, firm belief is still belief. It's not absolute awareness. It's a belief. I have faith and I believe and I trust. But there's something more for our lives because believing is one thing. But knowing is another thing. Big difference. We start out with hope that says, maybe, maybe, I kind of would like to. This would be wonderful to faith. I'm trusting and I'm trusting and I'm trusting and, I, and I'm having faith to step out. But then there's knowing. Wow, we've matured to a new level of comprehension and awareness, a new understanding, a new level of paying attention. Because in the knowing, it is here that we find that deep assurance. In the knowing that says, I know all things are working together for good. I know this. And when people say, how do you know? I just know. I just know. I know because my hope has moved to a strong faith, a strong faith that I built on that says, now I can know that all things are working together for me. I believe 
with such intensity that I move beyond just a faith that says I'm trusting. I no longer need to conjure up a trust. It's now, I just know. I just know. You know, there are those people who, when they jump out of the airplane with a parachute, need to truly have hope it's going to open, don't they? But that's not enough because you don't want to just go, I hope maybe it's going to open. You want to have faith. I trust it's going to open. But wait a minute, really? I am trusting. I have faith to believe it's going to open. But how about I know it's going to open? That's the person who jumps out of the plane with the parachute and says, I know it's opening. I can do it because there's such a peace. If you're just trusting and saying, I'm hoping and I'm trusting, it, ah, this cord's going to pull. It's going to work. It's going to work. It's going to work. I'm trusting. I'm, I'm trying to conjure up this faith and believing. But ah, when you know, you know. And there's a perfect peace that comes to your life. There's a calm, an ability to step out, take risks, to believe in new ways, and to just walk in this positive feeling that you know it's all working out. Everything is good. It's all good. It's all good. Can we say that together? It's all good. Wait a minute. I think you need to be more familiar with that. Let's say it again. It's all good. Now, do you know it's all good? If you know it, then say it again. It's all good. How about, I know it's all good. Suddenly, woo, the maturity level has just gone up. That meter, woo, childhood, teenage, we've gone to senior citizens here. We have now moved to a new level that says, I know. And I'm at this wonderful knowing stage because you know what's so beautiful about knowing? Knowing is love. Let me tell you this. Because when you love, you really know. And the understanding or the explanation of true knowing is a true sense of love, you know? Because when you are in love and you're truly in love and you're not in lust, uh, you're not in infatuation, but when you're in love, you know. It's that wonderful place that says, I'm not hoping this person will love me. I'm not believing or trusting. I'm simply knowing. How beautiful it is. Robert and I have been together 19 years, and I can wake up in the morning. It's not, I hope you love me. It's not, I'm trusting you love me. It's, I know you love me. What a comfort that is. What a place to be in a relationship that is. And so it is in our divine relationship with God when we come to the place that says, I simply love, and my love is grounded in a knowing. And my knowing is so grounded in loving. Scripture says faith, hope, and love are important, but the greatest of these is love. The greatest of these, of all these things, it's great to have hope, it's great to have faith, but the greatest thing arising to the level of saying, I have such a love that says, I know, I know that when I face a challenge, an obstacle, when I'm feeling that I'm in need of divine intervention, when I'm feeling like I want somehow to create and manifest something powerful within my life, I just simply say, I know, I know. And so it is, we say, in such a powerful way. And we look back in life, well, the elementary student hopes. The teenager stage may be filled with faith, but that mature adult comes to the understanding of knowing. So I ask you today, where are you? Where are you in your lifetime of spiritual Wherever you are, we offer that lifetime of spiritual growth assistance to help you on that journey, and that's our calling. That's our purpose. That's why, as a pastor, I'm praying for you every day. That's right. You're on my prayer list. I name your names. I call them out. I speak for your highest and best. I pray, claiming that good things are unfolding for you in health and finances and blessings of all levels, love, peace, joy, forgiveness, grace. All these wonderful things are there that I want to do the best I can as your shepherd to empower you. But it's not just that prayer. There's tangible ways where I'm offering classes. Reverend John Carn is offering classes. We're working together to develop these things for your spiritual growth because we don't want to leave you in an immature place. We don't want to leave you just at hope. 
although hope is wonderful. We don't even want to leave you just at faith. We want to evolve you and bring you all the way to the level of saying, I know. Woo! That's a place to be. I know. And that's what we're committed to. So when we say this is a place where there's a comfort there that should come to your life every Sunday, when we read that on the screen, this is a place where we offer a positive and practical approach to a lifetime, ongoing, never-ending journey of growth and development in your spiritual life. It never stops. Isn't that wonderful? The great joy is it never stops. It is ongoing. It's ongoing in your journey of unfolding. The flower is never blooming to a place where it stops and the rose is said that now it's a point of dying out. It's a spiritual life that is ever blooming, getting more and more beautiful in the journey of your lifetime. And that's the exciting news that you can leave the elementary teaching that the ancient writer of the book of Hebrews was described and you can mature. You can press on towards maturity for this is our purpose. We offer this positive practical teaching that takes you beyond hope, that moves you beyond faith, that takes you to this wonderful place of knowing. And so it is. Amen.